Hey, good evening. I'm Tony Mann. Thank you for coming tonight. And uh, we have a really, really cool guest tonight, Walter Schreifels from uh, Dead Heavens, among other cool bands he's played with. I'd like to thank um, Coney Allen Baby for their hospitality. And I'd like to introduce you now to author and filmmaker Stephen Blush. Come on, everybody, let's hear it for Tony Mann, our co host, and my right hand. What you're about to see is part of a series. Once a month, we sit down with some of the great minds of rock culture. I know the history and the backstory, which is why we call this the art of the interview. So thank you for coming. Um, tonight's guest needs relatively little introduction over the past 25 years. His sounds have literally defined the music of New York hardcore and New York rock in general. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Walter Schreifels. Yo, here's your microphone. Thank you. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, we could talk for a long time about you, but so let's just kind of get right into it. Um, let's start as your child, you know, you start in bands really young. So kind of talk about your childhood, getting into rock, your first rock moments, shows, emotions, feelings. Um, I was just thinking I miss therapy. Um, uh, I was just thinking of my first early things were uh, in Rockaway, playing in just basements, I think pretty typical. Like um, we had a band called The Rodents and we would write songs about people in our class that we wanted to make fun of. And, uh, and then eventually, I guess the, you know, the chain of events got to where I was in Gorilla Biscuits and then we got to play CBs. And I just remember not being able to sleep the night before and uh, just thinking of how scary it would be to actually be on the stage and at the same time very exciting. And um, those, are the, those are the big ones. And then after that, it was all kind of just whatever, it's a blur. Right. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk about some of that early stuff. Uh -huh. Like, well, first of all, I remember coming up at the late 70s, there were these. Uh, pills with 714 on them, right? Yeah. And they were really big, and that's why you use the name Gorilla Biscuits, yes. of course. Yes. Um, which, of course, was great for a straight edge band. But uh -huh. um, just kind of talk about uh, you guys. Uh, Gorilla Biscuits was amongst the first bands that was uh, kind of raised on the first generation, kind of raised on Minor Threat and SSD. So, kind of talk about the promise and the influence and the inspiration of those bands and Straight Edge and uh, as it played into you as well? Well, initially we, we were into um, Descendants and, uh, well, yeah, sure, Minor Threat, but I think there was a more punk side of it because, I mean, the name Gorilla Biscuits, like Siv the Singer, was just talking about drugs that he had sold. And, and that one came up. It's like, oh, that's the name of the band right there. That, that's a good one. So I... Um, it was kind of silly and, and fun, you know, in that way. So it wasn't really, although, you know, I was a fan of Minor Threat, I was a fan of so many other things. But I think as the hardcore scene started to, in New York, started to get more aggressive and we wanted to be a part of that more, I think we moved over towards, yeah, SSD and um, trying to be more connected to that and less connected to the melodic punk which, um, but I think that that still kind of spirit stayed with the band, which which made it more set us apart somewhat. Mm -hmm. You're talking about CBGBs, which of course the matinees are mm -hmm. kind of key to the whole thing. Now, I guess it's your second matinee that uh, gets the shows shut down there. And, well, we, and uh, I was gonna, I was just gonna also say it's like some of those shows were pretty ultra violent to begin with, so it must have really been something to actually for your show to help shut it down. Yeah, I can remember being at an AF show at CB's, like it was a very formative show where I was just 
underneath all these people and just if you ever when you're at the beach and I grew up in Rockaway so there'd be like hurricane waves would come in and you just get knocked under and you'd be in the whitewash and you'd just be like oh my god I could drown or die but you just got to chill to get out of it like that's how I was like in the pit at CB's in AF <laughs> like I want to see my mom again <laughs> and just being in this thing and just being like don't fight it just go with it and just kind of like go backwards find the edge and then and then getting out to the side and be like okay i'm not going in again right now <laughs> um but the show that we did that uh like shut down this so this was uh for for uh for if you you know the things in new york hardcore that are to the people that were there are so like powerful in our imaginations because you know we were teenagers and this was like cbgb's and we had a sense of it being what it was you know what i mean we knew that all music had and culture had been so affected and for some reason this amazing club was forgotten and we got to be the main thing it, it, at least in our minds you know what i mean and, and um when we got to like shut down the show so to speak it was really because i think uh hilly and his wife karen who was uh really hands-on for those hardcore shows they were dealing with uh you know when it was real like kids were getting hurt really badly and there was insurance and um issues and um so at our show you know it was just part of our you know asshole way to just be like not like what do you want us to do you know we we're gonna have stage diving and uh and it represented uh you know so karen was just pissed at at that and it ultimately didn't shut it down it just got us banned you know <laughs> um and then after that you s there's a short time where you're playing bass with uh warzone and um yes that's kind of like an imp it must be trial by fire learning mm -hmm. from Ray Bees, a really important character in this neighborhood. Yeah, Ray Bees was an incredible, uh, I mean, he, he was, he just loomed so large and in, in this scene and, and, you know, here we are in Avenue A, which is very nice. There's a 7-Eleven across the street. It's great, but when, I can just remember going to Odessa as a little kid, my mom taking me there and just seeing someone walk by with a mohawk and just being, feeling like I was in, you know, uh, liquid sky or something. It was just this far out world. And then I'm walking around with Ray B's on like Avenue B in the 80s and just uh, how that really expanded my uh, little world. And uh, he just knew everybody and knew everything and, and he, you weren't scared walking around with him at all. He just could open all the doors and it was very cool. I, I loved, loved playing in Warzone, it was a lot of fun. And then you go on to Youth of Today, mm -hmm. which was a huge band in your life anyway. So mm -hmm. it must have always been like joining the Beatles or, or something. It was like exactly that. like joining the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, what I tell like, everybody. Yeah, yeah. It was like a huge moment, no doubt. Yeah. And um, they. Uh, and but I it came was like in a, as the cute one. Right. <laughs> but it was also like a very strange part of that band's history because yeah. they had broken up uh -huh. and then they're like back together and yeah. you're touring with the adolescents I think if I yeah. remember correctly. Yeah, oh that was and, fantastic, yeah. Right, and so uh, not just um, your memories of that band but also being in definitely like the most intense pro straight edge, pro Krishna, anti heavy metal mm. band like ever, right? I mean, the, uh, that was I like I think that maybe would be the the way that it would be seen in some way, but I could, I think that's really just because it was in contrast to the sort of uh, it was in contrast to the, the image that I went to CBGBs in the first place for, like danger, you know, broken glass, bad drugs, like that that whole idea was um, what attracted me, not that I want, I just wanted, you know, I had seen Suburbia, I had seen Repo Man, I wanted something dangerous. And Youth, when I got there, it was cool, but a little bit dead. And Youth Today came in with this new, almost, um, you know, very uh, positive message, which was in a way a rebellion within that. And I don't think that it was like anti-metal as much as it was uh, it, getting into the pure aspects of like SSD or, or a negative approach, you know, a negative approach, uh, maybe less minor threat, but these bands that had maybe a few years before really defined 
the style, you know, this new kind of music that no, you know, it, music gets new kinds of music get get invented only w w once in a while, you know. There's like uh, and and minor threat, negative approach, and and you know, definitely agnostic front, and and these bands really invented something that youth today was saying like let's do that let's not do crossover metal and i think that was refreshing to me there was a severity to all this music that is kind of like unseen even today mm -hmm. um you had that project right around that time project x mm -hmm. which is just so negative and so mm. like intense yeah um like there's a song "Dance Floor Justice," yes. I remember where it's there's like, a drunk in the pit. Yeah, there's a drunk in the pit. He's messing with my friends. I'm gonna make it end. It's awesome, <laughs> it's awesome, right? So severe, like it was just more parody. I think to be honest, like parodying our own story. You know what I mean? Because um, that's how how I perceived it. Because in truth, you know, I I didn't have anything against people that drank. You know, one of my favorite bands was Murphy's Law, who were the embodiment of drinking and smoking weed. I didn't do that at that time because I was just into this other trip, but uh, it didn't make the things that I was into before not cool. So the idea of doing something that is to the ultimate extreme in the way it looks, in the way that it sounds, and the in the name of it, and all that kind of thing, is something that I was attracted to from a long, from a, from a young age. You know, you see the Ramones, they look the same. They're called the Ramones. It sounds like that. It's just cool. So here's a band that is called Project X. They will beat up drunk people, and it just works. Yeah. And the music's good. I, I mean, I think it is, it's good. Um, a lot of us were friendly with uh, Jerry Williams, who worked with the Bad Brains. And uh, through him, that's how I knew your bass player, Sergio Vega. Right, so I remember hearing your first demo, maybe 1989, 1990. And I just remember being drawn to it, but also feel like how it was such a New York kind of sound. But also that, I guess the word became post-hardcore later, but there was undeniably something with you and Fugazi and... Paige Hamilton and Helmet that was going on, which was innately punk rock just in its attitude. It wasn't, didn't really sound like, it wasn't punk rock, but it certainly was that. I just think it's a very important movement that sometimes gets overlooked. I don't yeah. know if you have Yeah, thank you. Um, I think with uh, the hardcore music scene that I got involved with and, and, and had these really cool ex experiences and, and just... I think a lot of people run through the hardcore thing, and they, they, if you notice, all, a lot of the bands have like one album, two albums, tops, an EP. A lot of bands are, you know, playing in Europe, European festivals because they had an EP or a demo tape. It just runs its course for a lot of people, and um, I think that the power of the scene here in in New York was so really, really great, and it was um, kind of cresting and getting at its most popular. Uh, when it was also at the same time CBGB's wasn't booking shows and it was getting very violent because it was popular. So um, at the same time, it was kind of, you know, collapsing. But I think as a musical endeavor, or as I started to think of myself as a musician, or Sergio, someone like that, or Jerry Williams, like these are, these are music people, or Paige, the people that you mentioned, and they're taking that energy and reinterpreting for, for some doing something new. I mean, we weren't thinking about necessarily, there was no target that we were trying to hit. We were just taking our experiences and maybe um, trying to make something that would be broader, or more interesting to people outside of, you know, this sort of ritualized, really getting violent and not, and not so, so fun. And it, for me at that time, that's how I felt about it. Then, you know, with Quicksand, it gets kind of interesting because there's this Nirvana explosion. And, like, everybody gets kind of swept up in it. And I'm sure that's how you ended up at Polygram somehow. And, yeah. And, um, but kind of just talk about what was going on. Because <clears throat> I always felt like the New York bands already were nasty and grungy. Uh -huh. So the, the idea of grunge was a little, fo yeah. that wasn't that radical. Right. Right. So. Oh, I thought we didn't stand a chance. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the when Nirvana came up, Nirvana were so amazingly powerful, and um, I was into their their record on Sub Pop, uh, Bleach, and and they were just so 
cool and sludgy and amazing, but they also had this melody. And, you know, when they, when they got really popular and, uh, you know, in Pearl Jam and uh, obviously even just saying from Nirvana to Pearl Jam, it's like not that Pearl Jam aren't awesome too, but it's just, it was pop. It became just like about melody and New York is not really, our scene is not melody. It's about vibe. It's about design for a club about this big. But yet we were cool and we were in New York City and this is where all the industry was. So like all of our bands got signed and we, I think we were, you know, I'm not putting it down. I think Helmet were amazing and, and, and Quicksand were, you know, if I can say, I think we were really great. Um, I, I think that there was something about our sound that was really, really tight to New York City. And, uh, you know, there was be certain pockets of places, but I, I didn't see us as as uh, pop, we, we couldn't compete with Stone Temple Pilots, you know, it wasn't happening, you know. And then there's um, <coughs> the Civ Project, which yeah. is, is that a what hit wonder? Is that what you would call that? So, uh, the Civ Project was because, the, you know, we, Gorilla Biscuits would only, was broken up maybe four or five years or something, but at the time it seemed like a, a long time actually. And, uh, and Civ was tattooing and I was living with the guitar player, Charlie Garrigo, uh, for Civ, and we were just thinking we should make a band with Civ. Mm -hmm. And so we started just playing. We had a couple of songs, and then we presented it to Civ, like, hey, can we make a band up, and you're the singer, and we're going to call it Civ. <laughs> and and uh, he was just, what? <laughs> um, yeah, Civ. And, uh, you know, because people wouldn't know what it was and people who would know what it was would think, whoa, that's the guy from Grill Biscuits. And um, but so we it gave us more le kind of a little more room to um, do hardcore stuff, which people would be really psyched on and also do other pop stuff or not. I think it was to me, it was pop oriented stuff. You know, maybe from that initial idea of what Gorilla Biscuits would be, you know, the more punky, poppy and. Uh, and get away with it without having to bring Gorilla Biscuits back, you know, really. And so it worked out really great. Our friend of ours, we had these two songs, and a friend of ours uh, from Jackson Heights, he was wanted to make videos, and uh, and he had this great idea at that time. There was this whole talk show thing was happening with Ricky Lake, and uh, Homeboy, um, he's still doing the poor guy. Uh, what's his name? Uh, no, Marcos is fine. I'm trying to think of the uh, Jerry Spr Spring, Jerry Springer. I was going to say Jerry Springfield. Um, uh, he, you know, that was just like this insane thing that everyone was hyping on. And then he came up with this great concept. And um, so we made the video ourselves. We recorded the song ourselves. And I don't know, I presented it to somebody. And then we, we got a record deal on Atlantic Records. And, and that happened very quickly. It was, it was really cool. Because it kind of started with <clears throat> a lot of punk credibility, even though this is kind of the start of, I guess, what they called the ball punk yeah. era. Yeah. You know, you're doing a single, your single is, the first single is the cover of Kraut, all twisted. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, we were Right, so it's fans. like kind of true to the, to yeah, the whole I mean, it thing. Yeah, I mean, it was, we were having fun and doing, I think the record still holds up really well, actually. I'm, I'm proud of it. Now, you wrote all those songs, basically, mm. and... Also, um, Gorilla Biscuits, you wrote all mm -hmm. those songs. Mm -hmm. Like, the demos, you singing. It's like yeah. a one-man band. And hardcore is like a collaborative thing, usually. And, you know, what you're doing is almost like where, you know, Brian Wilson or Prince or, you know, somebody like that who's... Pretty I'm much. Not, not, not <laughs> like a combination of the yeah. two. I wouldn't weigh heavily on one or the other. It's like... But it is like kind of unusual, you know, that's one reason I want to have you here too, because yeah. I kind of see like you subsume your personality a lot in Thank these you. projects, which is kind of usually what smart people do. They kind of like subsume their personality, like they bury it like mm. a little bit. Like, I don't know, you know, like uh, whatever, David Bowie Tin Machine, let's yeah. say. I'm not put you on that level, but I'm just saying that it's, it's like just Like where you're going with it? Yeah, well, you could go there for sure. Um, I think that... But I think it says a lot as an artist to be able to, like, put yourself under. Thank you. I, I think that while I was writing the songs, it's also not to 
say that without the chemistry of the people that I'm working with and their personalities, like it's just like, you know, when you're around a certain, I think, you know, people are so, there's so many people, every, everybody has their personality, how they are with their family, how they are with this group of friends, how they are in school, how they are at work, you know what I mean? All these different, so the chemistry, how you are with a group of people, um, that person, like how I am with Gorilla Biscuits, like the reason I was able to do the things I was able to do was because of the people that I was with. And so they thought the ideas that I thought were ridiculous, they were down to go with. So I felt like this is fun and that creates a creative atmosphere that's really, you know, where you have you don't have limits and it brings out the best in you. And with each different group of people and the different things that I've done, I really play to that. You know, I think of like what will make this, what will spark that person's best side, and and you know, if I'm like, I just feel like those the chemistry is is really important, and also everybody's contributing. So it's like I couldn't say like, I'm I'm not someone that's coming in and showing everybody what to do or telling everybody. I can be a jerk and say like that's you know, but uh, if I feel like something's should be one way and not the other, but. Um, but I think all those like, different experiences is about the different times and different chemistries of, of the people. And, and also I'm just, I'm interested in trying to do something different and I, I enjoy it. Yeah, I was gonna say as much as you do this lot of the composition and all that, you also have an incredible array number of bands, outfits that you've been involved in. And I guess my question was, you know, rival schools or walking concert or, or your solo or any of these projects, they're, they're not, there's different nuances, but they're not radically different music. So it's not like you're playing bebop or hip hop or something. Um, so how do you distinguish that? Because it almost feels to me like it's your reason to play with other specific musicians. Yeah. So I wasn't quite sure, is it like a musical thing or is it like the opportunity? that it presents? I guess it's the, you know, just, I never expected to be doing this, you know, it was just, I, when we did, uh, we got Gorilla Biscuits together, I surely did not think of it as something like any sort of career, and it's just led to different paths, and, um, but I think that it's, uh, you know, different inspirations just kind of hit me, and different life circumstances just kind of come together, and, and, and that, and I've been, fortunate that I get to, that I've been able to document them in, in different periods with, with different bands, and I still am doing it, you know, I still am thinking about, you know, what is the next thing that would be, I always think it's good to do something that makes you feel a little wobbly and uncertain, and then that's always the thing that you're kind of afraid of doing is the one that you should go for, it's kind of I, someone said that in yoga class I went to or something. I don't know. It stuck with me. But you step, stepped outside of yourself a lot, too. Try to. Yeah. And, uh, like, I mean, you even read the label. for You had a label for a while. Yes. And so kind of talk about some records, the store, and also some records, the short-lived label. I remember yeah. talking to you at the time when you had put that together. Yeah, some records, the store was... Uh, this really small, like, uh, as small of a, of a storefront as you could have on, uh, I guess it was on 5th, and, um, and when I, right off of, of 3rd Avenue, and, and so anyway, when I went there, you know, getting into the hardcore scene and finding it, you know, nowadays, I mean, whatever, nowadays, you, everything's easy, you can find everything. Back then, you couldn't find anything. And so, uh, a friend of mine took me, okay, we're going to go to the punk record store, the hardcore record store. It's going to be so amazing. There's going to be punks there. And instead, it's this kind of like indie rock, kind of Thurston Moore looking guy with like two racks of records in this teeny, teeny space. And it's called Some Records. So it's like <laughs> this the most generic thing ever. And um, it was, you know, I was ex just expecting something more. And... Uh, but within those two racks of records were these, just any one of them could have changed your life. You know, any one of the hundred records he had on offer. You know, I, I often think like, I wish I had gotten into the Cramps earlier. You know, like if I just bought the Cramps record instead of, 
you know, the suicidal tendencies record, I would be a different person. But suicidal tendencies just seem crazier. And uh, that was this small space that, that we got to go in. So anyway, when we, uh, it, you know, eventually they got a little bit bigger um, and they kind of merged with a, a store that 99X, which sold Doc Martens and Fred Perry's. And anyway, it's great. But uh, when uh, a friend, a couple friends of mine, uh, Sam Siegler, who played in Civ and, and played in uh, Judge and a bunch of bands, uh, Youth Today, and a friend of ours, uh, Matt Pincus, who also played in Judge, wanted to start a record label. And um, so we were thinking of what would be a, a cool name for it. And so we asked Dwayne, who was the indie rock Thurston Moore looking dude, and he said, yeah, that's great. So some is such a solid name. I think Matt still owns the URL, which is like gold. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, getting into the record business ourselves, uh, I don't know that we were... I love all the bands, and we had so much fun doing it. We, uh, I remember actually when this was Brownies, ha having a meeting with uh, Interpol before anybody wanted to sign them, uh, and um, they were just kicking out their first drummer, and shit got weird, but they were way too smart to sign with us. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, we were interested in the music that we liked, but in the course of it, uh, Taking Back Sunday, we were like, eh, I don't feel it. Uh, <laughs> we're into Eric, Eric Mingus's album. And uh, who else? Thursday, ah, I don't get it. You know, like we're getting all these amazing bands that went on to do this other amazing things, but we did get Era Type 11, we did get Six Going On Seven, we got uh, J Majesty, um, and, and it's no discredit to those other bands that are so awesome, and I'm friends with all of them, but uh, we were looking to um, do something different and, uh, and sort of unexpected, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I, don't know. I also want to talk about work ethic, <clears throat> because um, that's a lot about what we're talking about here. Um, uh, that's why there's so many records, so many bands, which is a very Queens, Outer Borough kind of aesthetic and a very hardcore aesthetic, too. I mean, rock and roll, punk rock, that's kind of lazy. You know, p hardcore was hard and, and industrious and DIY. and So kind of talk about how that approach that you learned. I often talk about the ethic of it comes from two places. It comes from your family and it comes from the hardcore scene. I, know. I think that's a good point. I, I think that the the New York hardcore scene, like the biggest, people don't know, but I think where I, it's not where I grew up in, I grew up in Rockaway, but when I moved to Astoria and lived in Jackson Heights, like that's really the heart of New York hardcore. You know, there was people that lived in the Lower East Side and, and, and there's lots of people from Manhattan, but I mean, so much of it came from Queens. And, you know, when I was going to high school in Long Island City High School, there would be like, communist people trying to recruit high school students there. Like, there was, it was working class people, salt of the earth. That's what Astoria and, and Jackson Heights w w was. And, and, you know, now it's probably changed to some degree, of course, but that, that's that work ethic and that sort of no bullshit, you know, hardcore reality ethos is, you know, Pretension is, is, was not a thing that, it didn't thrive in, in this scene. You know, you'd go to a big show at the Ritz and, and exploit it or someone that was popular from England would play and there would be a, a, a larger selection of people that were, you know, maybe peacocking out more. But like in, in, in New York scene, it was like real, you know, Queens, no bullshit, mm -hmm. you know. And, and Brooklyn, you know, credit to all the boroughs, but I think that that ethos runs through it and you know i think in no i want the example i think of the most uh comes to mind is sick of it all i mean those people they they've been working their ass off for like 30 years doing something that they love but it isn't easy you know what i mean but they don't they're not crying about it i mean the band's called sick of it all so i guess it's <laughs> something there but you know what i mean i guess a lot of you know working class people can relate to that idea mm -hmm. you know um, we could talk for, for a long time, but I'm going to start wrapping up. And by the way, we're going to take a few questions. Uh, uh, you'll stand over there, walk over and uh, ask a question in a little while if you, if you dare. Um, 
But I just kind of wanted to talk about music today because you're still really active. Dead Heavens is a hot band. And um, I just want your impressions of music today. Uh, I mean, to me, what I see is like, like while the mainstream is like atrocious, there is like a vibrant something bubbling under. Maybe I'm, I don't know if you share that feeling, but that's kind of, it seems a little more exciting than it was maybe five, ten years ago, let's say. Yeah, I would say to, to cast it in a positive light, I think that there's a lot of, um, I think the there was a time when it would be, people were trying to make it to the top, right? And I think nowadays, people are just, want to have a really cool party and make something fun for their for their little group of people. And I think that that creates the possibility, it takes the pressure off, you know what I mean? I mean, of course, there's still this, like, industry idea, but I think that that's been kind of taken off the table, and so I think people are doing more wild stuff, and there's definitely, I, I find that re refreshing, and I think there's so many, so much to choose from that's that's new that would make a, a you know of course like it's not going to last necessarily because people are off and on to the next thing but when you think about you know again i'm thinking of the ramones like the things that that inspired them were these songs from the 1960s that were just cool and fast and then gone you know it was like you know no, question mark and the mysterians like i you don't need to buy their third album it's like 96 tears and we're good yeah. you know and, and everybody's happy for, like, generations. That song will make people psyched in 100 years. Mm -hmm. They won't have a choice. And so I think nowadays people can more just have that one moment, and if they have a little extra oomph, then they can go to the next thing. But I think it requires, um, yeah, you know, you need to have that work ethic, and you have to be into it on a bunch of different levels, you know. And, uh, you know, you have to be cut out for it, and... Uh, you have to really enjoy it or it, it gets old fast, you know. But I, I'm, I'm kind of up on it, you know. I would totally, given the choice, I just read something where, you know, if everyone just, some sort of thing where, hey, what if we all just gave up our social media right now? Like, what would that be like? I'd be, I'm down, let's go. Yeah. But things being what they are, you know, let's make the most of it and just really freak out and, 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 and take chances and... Right, right on. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tony, um, okay, uh, any questions? Any questions from the audience? Hey there. Should I tell them that I brought sick prizes? Oh, yeah. I brought sick prizes. Let's hear it for Coming Walter along. and Stephen Blush, everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you for coming. Uh, does anyone have a question for Walter? He has some pretty cool prizes. Uh, you, sir, come on up. It's like hey, Wonderama. What's your, what's your name? Franz. Right on, Franz. What's your question? <laughs> it's Frank, like uh, Z in the end. Uh, anyway, no, I, was, uh, I just finished reading uh, Roger's book from Agnostic Front. And, uh, well, I read a couple of other books, and I'm, I'm now close to my 40s. Uh, so I was thinking about like, how do you feel about like the, the whole, like, historization of of hardcore New York hardcore and special, um, since like there's been so many books coming out, like movies coming out. To me, like from a from a German perspective, we kind of got the same shit going on right now, that a lot of people are like, they're they're documenting their life and and what they did. Uh, but to me, to some extent, it feels like putting the whole thing to a museum and being like, okay, that's that. It's like now we're, now we're here and now we're, now we're settled. That's that. It's like it's, it's, it's part of history. Like it's, like it's over, right? Yeah, like it's over. And, it, and of course it isn't. I mean, of course, like if you look at Agnostic Front or you, for example, I mean, you're still active. You're still in the scene, you're still doing bands and, and, and stuff. How do you feel about like the whole, like getting that, yeah, to some extent it feels like some people try to like, nah, it's over. I get you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, with the available, uh, you know, 
you know, at some point further back in time, it would be too expensive to document all this crap. And now it's just like you can just do it. And, and uh, again, it kind of maybe re re goes back to what the, the last point is, is like, okay, yes, I totally agree with you. Like, my idea of what things were like, I mean, I, I went to some shows that certain people would think, that's amazing, you went to that show. And when I was going to that show, it's like thinking, shit, I missed the cool shows, you know what I mean? So, you know, it, I think it has to do with your youth and, and, and all these kind of things, like what you perceive as being the cool time. And there is definitely a, 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 so much to everything. Everybody's got a documentary, but what are we going to do? This is the time we're documenting every freaking moment that we're of our lives. This is just our culture. I'm down to to quit if everyone else is, but if everyone's doing it, I'm not going to miss out. You know, I'll, I'll watch some of it if I'm <laughs> flipping around. YouTube shit works out. I'm like documentary of German hardcore. You got some subtitles. I'll watch it. Thank you. Good answer. Um, and uh, stick around later. We'll have a cool prize. I feel like the you. prizes should be presented because they're pretty dope. I brought them from my house, and they're cool. They are dope. <laughs> yeah. um, anyone else have a question for, uh, for Walter? Anybody else? Come on, come on up here, sir. Sorry. Take your time, too. I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, Goody Girl Cookies for providing yeah, some Shira, thank yummy you. snacks. Right. And I would like to take a they moment are to... Uh, Tell everybody, please go to the show in Tompkins Square Park on the 29th. There's going to be a benefit for our friend Jimmy Gestapo, Jim Stresher from Murphy's Law. And he's uh, touched all of our lives. Let's go support the guy. Come on, all right? It's a free show. Drew Stone and some other cool people are putting this on. There's great. Oh, they can only get the Mighty Mighty Boss tone, so whatever. <laughs> we'll, we'll make do. And some other great bands. So please, please attend. It's free, okay? Mm -hmm. Support New York Hardcore. This is New York. All right. Uh, what's your name, sir? My name's Robert. Uh, hey, Robert. You have a question for Walter Schreifel. More of a comment. I also I grew up in Rockaway Beach. Oh, cool. And I went to junior high school 180. Oh my God. And I remember you. That's crazy. And I remember. You know this guy? Uh, not yet. <laughs> but I remember if I'm wrong, you did a talent show. Yes. And I remember the talent show, and I I just wanted to know if that was correct. So I just haven't. That's right amazing. Yeah. Yes, we did a talent show yeah. and. Uh, I think we played... Uh, I, think, I think you played a Beatles song. Yeah, we played uh, Twist and Shout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Isley Brothers, whatever. That's it. I just, you know, That's just amazing. had that memory in my head. I just wanted to point it out. See, life is wild and cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and thanks for your question, and get a prize later. He's got good prizes, so yeah. please come around later and get your prize. Uh, anybody else? Come on, sir. Come on up. Come on up for a minute. Hey, man. What's, what's, your, what's your name? My name's Paul. Thanks for coming, Paul. What is your favorite uh, places to play outside of the United States? The funnest place to play touring is to play in Japan. It's the best. It's just such a, a far out. It's so safe and so just crazy and, um, and just on 10. And yet just... It's not like you could go someplace that's on 10 and you'd feel danger. There, you don't feel any danger. And the other thing about Japanese people and culture, just they, it's so on them to uh, look out for you. So as a guest, it's just in their, it's just regs for them to like, you're not going to pay for stuff. They're going to look out for you. They're going to take you to the cool place. And that's why I love it the most. Uh, funny enough, you were talking about how you wanted to embrace that danger and your favorite country yeah. is the least dangerous of them all i've grown wiser. he brings the danger i'm not looking i'm not looking for that yeah i mean it's it's I, I, I understand yeah from. Just, i just thought it was a little ironic good, yeah i mean as good, a, as a kid you want to you want to uh you want to push boundaries you want to see what's up and and uh as an adult i'm cool with just having a nice time with my friends very good. In Japan, you know, that's... that's Arigato. Cool. <laughs> Thank you for the question. How about uh, you, sir? Come on up. Thank you for coming. What's your name, sir? Uh, real sweet and real short. Uh. I feel personally that there's been someone left out on this. You mentioned them right yeah. at the beginning, Jerry Williams. When's yeah. the documentary going to be done on him? Oh, All right, Jerry. let's hear it for Jerry Williams. Yeah. We're right next to 171A right now. Yeah. He's a very good friend of ours. Yeah. Right on. That's right. That's crazy. 
Yeah, Jerry. Uh, he, he he's he's huge. I think he's he's felt throughout. Uh, you know, he's just so iconic. You know, when we were coming up, he was the guy that had seen it and done it, and he just had such a cool vibe. And you know, his his work with the Bad Brains is just lives on and ins it will inspire forever. I mean, that's just you. Yeah, for me, like when we formed Voltron, he was the head. Right on. He's the head of a Voltron. He's that yeah, level. Me outside, yeah. He's he he was something else, man. I I think people know he definitely you know if we're making documentaries, I watch that one. I'd like to I'd like to say something about I'd like to say something about Jerry Williams. I went to the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction of the Beastie Boys in Cleveland, Ohio, with the Glory Jones from T Rex. They had a night from her, and we're waiting there, and the Beastie Boys are getting inducted. You know, one of the members, as we know, passed away, and that's right when he was very sick in the hospital. And it's like they're going on and on about Rick Rubin, and this is an arena 9,000 people and I yelled out Jerry Williams and they started crying and they had to talk about Jerry Williams so let's give it up for Jerry Williams man yeah. right on rock and roll very cool rock and roll thank you for your question anybody else we have one, we have one more thing. come on up what's your name what's going on Colin how's it going hey Colin uh, so question may be controversial uh, a couple questions about one subject Walter sings the hits the bootleg. Uh, how did that come out? Uh, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> what did you think about it when it came out? Uh, and is there a chance in hell we'll see a live Walter Sings a Hits? Oh wow, um, that that's that's a cool question. The uh, Walter Sings the Hits was uh, when we were doing the the Gorilla Biscuit album Start Today. I was going. I was booked on a tour with Youth Today to go to Europe. So we were we had finished the music, and uh, wanted to keep it on schedule. So normally I would work with Siv and and be there in the studio, but I, I wasn't gonna be able to do that. So to kind of get the vocal ideas across for him to do it when I wasn't there, uh, I just did like a one take pass on the whole album, and uh, you know holding the lyric sheets and just ran it, and uh, that cassette tape was just within the band, and I don't know how it got out beyond the band. It's like the Jerky Boys. It's like a Jerky Boys thing. <laughs> and, um, and then eventually uh, it was bootlegged, and uh, I found out a couple years ago, and when it, the bootleg came out, I didn't, I, I think my feeling with bootlegs is because people were giving me compliments about it and saying it was good, then I didn't really have a problem with it. I it thought was it was great. I'd love to see it live. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was interesting. Some years ago, a, a couple of few years ago, uh, Steve Aoki confessed that he was the one that had bootlegged it. And, Kid uh, millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was it was kind it was kind of interesting for him to to uh, confess to it because the, the other bootlegs, he's the only guy that's confessed to to bootlegging us. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. That's cool. Thank you for your question. Thank you, sir. And uh, I, I have one question for yeah. you. I would like to know how did uh, Dead Heavens come to be? How did it form? Because I've played in a lot of bands and uh, recordings with Paul Kostavi. And all of a sudden, he's like, I'm in this band. And he was really happy because uh, it's like, it's not my band. I'm just in there. I could leave. And yeah. So tell me about that. Paul Kostavi is a, uh, a great artist and, uh, and guitar player. And he, he's, he's a New York fixture. Uh, and he, uh, he's just done, Google him, he, he's, he's an amazing painter and, and musician. And, uh, well, I was looking to do uh, some new just solo material. And um, I had, uh, was playing with a couple of guys, and one of them was friends with Paul uh, through Cults. And uh, so he recorded some demos with us. And I just figured after we recorded the demos, like, Paul's such a badass guitar player, and he's got such a great vibe. Like, why don't we just get him? And the band will be cooler. Good call. And that was it. <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank I love you. the band. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Let's hear it for Walter Schreifels. Come thank on. Thank you man. all very much. And Thanks, Stephen Steve. Blush. All right. So let's hear it. Stephen Blush, the art of the interview. Walter Schreifels. And now, who do we have coming up the next month? Oh, we got two people. We got Vinny Stigma. And we have director Drew Stone. 
Well, All right, everybody's he's be showing some of his new New York hardcore film here. So, um, thank you for coming. We will see you next week on the Art of, of the, the Interview. interview.